Hello and welcome to this week's CareerWise, coming to you from London South Bank. We're here to discuss your news and views and examine some of the challenges that you face in work. This week, we take a look at the controversial proposals to reform your pensions. Full-time teaching until 65, I feel, would put an awful lot of the young people who are coming into the profession really off. And in the drive to an integrated Europe, we ask, is there really a crisis in modern language teaching? When they made languages non-compulsory, it's giving out a message to children that they don't need to learn a language. It emphasises their belief that everyone's just going to speak English. We find out what it's like to live and teach in one of London's most diverse and vibrant boroughs, Camden. And in the TES Job Check, we'll be highlighting the current hot jobs and analysing the latest employment trends to find out what they might mean for you. This week, in a declining market for modern language teachers, our career expert, John McKenley, will be here to discuss the options for teachers in a changing curriculum. The subject of pensions is always one of hot debate. I'll be joined in the studio today by the DFES's Head of Pensions, Paul Bleasdale. Now, we've all heard about the general crisis facing pensions, and teachers are not exempt. Earlier this year, the DFES's consultation process on teachers' pensions took place. And here's what some of you thought of the proposals. I think the current situation with pensions is, is perfectly acceptable as it stands. It's always been very fair. Uh, we've been able to pay into extra AVCs if, uh, if we wanted to. So at the moment, I'm perfectly happy with the situation. I think that teachers have very, you know, the pensions are very good and I just don't like the changes that they're suggesting right now. Teachers have reacted with horror. Uh, to the notion that uh, in order to get the sort of level of pensions they, they currently get, they'll increasingly have to work a lot longer than they do at the moment. They're trying to attract young people into the profession and I think all of these things will, will maybe reduce people's wish to come in and join teaching because it, it seems to me it's making it less flexible and giving you less options. A lot of concerned voices there, Paul. Is this measure not going to do terrible damage to teachers' morale? No, I, I don't think it is. I mean, uh, teachers will still be able to retire at 60 if that's what they choose to do. But the reality is that pension schemes across the country and public service pension schemes, including the teacher scheme, are no different to this, are facing real cost pressures. And the changes that are proposed in the consultation document offer a whole range of modifications and improvements which I think teachers will value and appreciate. It sounds like you're saying this is going to be a positive improvement for teachers. Will we ask some members whether they would in fact be happy to pay higher contributions in return for an improvement in their benefits package? If we're expected to pay higher contributions, um, we need to already be paid enough in order to pay the higher contributions. And I don't feel that as a profession we're valued enough or that we're paid enough, I suppose I would say that, uh, in order to pay those higher contributions. So no, I don't think that's fair. I wouldn't mind as long as it's, we do get the actual benefits that come along with it. I think it's actually quite a good way of saving for the future. It's the usual sort of thing of sort of bread today and jam tomorrow. You know, you give us this now and then in the future I'm sure that such and such will be returned. And understandably, um, people are suspicious about things because they feel they've been conned in the past. And so even if perhaps this time the truth is being told, people understandably a bit cynical. Yeah, put it away now and you might see it later. You're going to have a job convincing teachers who already feel underpaid to contribute more for these improved benefits? I think there's a couple of points on that. Um, the first is that a public service scheme has to be affordable and has to be justifiable to the taxpayer who picks up the cost. Um, what we're proposing is not that teachers have to pay more than the 6% that the current contribution is, and, and bear in mind for, for every 6% that teachers pay, employers already pay 13.5% on top of that. But what we have put out in our consultation document is questions about whether teachers might be willing to go beyond the 6% if that meant an improvement in the pension package that was on offer to them. OK, well, let's move on to perhaps the most controversial proposal, raising the retirement age from 60 to 65. Here's what some of you thought. Raising the retirement age to 65 fills me with horror. I don't think at 65 you should be working with 32 adolescents. I think it's too much. It would, it would make me consider either leaving the profession 
or seriously considering my options. Full-time teaching until 65, I feel would put an awful lot of the young people who are coming into the profession really off. I love my job. Um, I love it lots and lots, but one of the things in that you've got to, it's very hard work um, and I think the thought of having to carry on for another five years is not particularly appealing. People between 60 and 65 haven't the energy, they have they probably got the know-how to a degree but it's extremely tiring job, it's hands-on and I don't think that it's a good step at all. They'll still be able to go before 65 but only uh, with very heavy reductions in their pension benefits. I think that's a shame if if people are forced to do it. I think it's it's fine. I'm, I'm myself, I'm 62, so I've chosen to go beyond retirement age. Um, but I think it has to be choice. I actually have a friend who is now 70 and he is still doing some part-time teaching. Now, we kid him about it a little bit, but I can certainly imagine myself doing the same. Two things uh, emerged there, Paul. One, teachers are uneasy about having to work until they're 65 and not being able to jump at 60 with a nice big fat pension package. And the other one is that why should they have to keep contributing like this? Well, there's nothing in the proposals which require teachers to work until any particular age. They will still be able to retire at before or after 60 as they can now. What is changing is the pension age, and, and, and I have to differentiate pension age and retirement age. Pension age is, is simply the age at which you can access an unreduced pension. Retirement age is, a, is the age at which you go into retirement, and the two are not necessarily the same thing. But there's nothing in the proposals which will stop teachers having um, the choice of when they would want to draw their pension. We're very keen that teachers are given opportunities to manage the transition from work to retirement in a way which suits them best. And basically you're making it down to the teacher to keep those contributions up themselves? Well, there are two aspects to it. I mean, part of the proposals as well is to increase the level of benefits that teachers get compared to the present arrangements. And whilst a lot has been said about age 65, the new suggested pension arrangements would mean that teachers could get the same level of benefits as they can under the existing scheme by the age of 62 and a half. So it's, it's not a question of just 65. Um, but I think the other aspect of it is the flexibilities around how teachers move from work to retirement. This cliff edge of working full-time and then going into full-time retirement is, is not appropriate and is not what a lot of teachers want to do. They want to wind down towards retirement. And what we're trying to do is, is to create a pension scheme which supports those flexibilities. But if you retired at the age of 60 in five years' time, uh, you'd actually be getting less than you would if you retired at the age of 60 today, wouldn't you? No, no, you wouldn't. Um, there's a long transitional period for existing teachers. The, the higher pension age will apply to new entrants to the teaching profession from 2006, but won't apply to existing teachers until 2013. And even then, it only applies to the service after 2013. Well, another of the proposals is that from the year 2010, teachers will have to wait until the age of 55 instead of 50 before they start to claim their pension back. Here's what some of you think of that. To work until 50, 55 isn't that big a deal. Even the teaching profession has to fit in a bit with what's currently going on, with the rise in the age of the population. I think there has to be some adjustment. I think also, however, that with the stress of certain jobs that they on health grounds should have a definite case for retiring that much earlier or stepping down to do part-time or something of that nature. So what genuine benefit is this measure going to have for teachers? Well the proposal is going to apply to all members of all occupational pension schemes not just members of the teacher scheme or even of the public service scheme so it apply equally to all private sector pension schemes as well. And it's just a recognition of the, the facts of life that everybody is living longer and that drawing pensions at age 50 is unaffordable and bad for the economy. Yes, but we haven't jumped from a mortality rate of 28 in the Middle Ages up, up to now. I mean, this has been known for some time, isn't it? And yet teachers are expected to make up for the shortfall. I don't think teachers are making up anything for any shortfall in this particular context. I mean, this is simply the minimum age at which they can draw pension benefits. With one exception, which I think is important and I would like to make in that, that is that teachers who retire on the grounds of ill health will still be able to do so at any age. And finally, a proposal that has caused a great deal of annoyance amongst teachers, the proposal to scrap the perk that allows teachers to continue contributing to their pension up to three years after they leave the profession. I think basically that's a stupid idea. Um, I feel that 
that, that is a perk which has probably has kept some of us in the profession longer than perhaps we would have done otherwise. Anything that would encourage people, any perk would be brilliant because the salaries of themselves, um, particularly in a place like London, are not good. They're not high enough. They can't even afford anywhere to live. I think that if you start chipping away at a body of people that are providing a very, very valuable service. At some point, this is going to catch up with you because you've got a, group, a, a body of people that are thinking to themselves, hey, hold on a second, is it worth it? This has caused a great deal of annoyance amongst teachers who feel that you know, they're being denied the ability to improve their pensions after they leave the profession. Well, I think there's, there's a, again, a couple of points I need to make in, in response to that. The first is that we haven't actually proposed scrapping any particular provisions of the scheme. The consultation document indicates that we are questioning whether it is still legitimate and appropriate to have that provision. But once you ask the question, it means that you're moving towards getting rid of it, surely? Well, I mean, the, the whole purpose of the consultation was to seek the views of, of teachers and, and others with an interest in the scheme about whether there are arguments for retaining the provision either in its existing or modified form. We've had the responses and now we'll be analysing them and we will be taking it forward in discussions with the teacher unions and employer associations in the light of that. Well, I, I mean, I can not prejudge your uh, report, but surely no teaching unions, no teachers would have agreed with uh, getting rid of this particular scheme. I'm surprised that there's been so much concern expressed about this particular provision as it is so little used. We've got 600,000 current members of the scheme and we've only got 170 people who actually are currently making use of this particular facility. Yeah, I know, but given the changes that you are proposing, isn't this going to be one way at least that teachers can bump up the final value of their pensions? Well, it's actually because of the changes that we're proposing that we're calling into question this particular facility because we, we've put forward suggestions and ideas about much greater flexibility which enable teachers to buy additional pension benefits during their career so they can plan better for it. The question we're asking is whether in the light of all those changes and the little use that this provision is made to, should it remain a feature of the scheme as we go forward? Well, Paul Bleasdale, thanks very much indeed for joining us on CareerWise today. No doubt we'll be returning to the subject again and again, so I hope you're not considering early retirement. Not at the moment, but thank you for asking. If you're not thinking of retiring just yet, you may be considering moving to a different part of the country. One of London's most vibrant boroughs is Camden, and we find out what it's like to live and teach there. A wonderful place to live. It's very nice because it's so close to inner city London, so you get lots of the things you get from being in a big city, but it doesn't feel like that. We've got Hampstead Heath very close by, uh, which is a lovely place for walks and just enjoying nature. There's everything available, there's absolutely everything. There's restaurants, bars, films, theatres not far away because you can easily get into town. And then there's the open space as well. Also, Camden Town is a, a wonderful place to visit, uh, very different from Hampstead. There's lots of music venues down there, lots of great pubs, and it's a wonderful place just to wander around and um, sort of people watch as well. South Camden is, is very different because you're getting into inner city. You've got schools around Euston Station, King's Cross, that's all part of Camden. It's a very, very large borough. And then it spreads right up to what you call leafy Hampstead. Prices here are ridiculous. It's becoming nigh on impossible to buy as a first-time buyer in a profession that's publicly orientated like teaching or nursing. Within the borough of Camden, I think it's very difficult for teachers to buy. Uh, predominantly, uh, the prices here are very high. You're starting really at one bedroom flat around 200,000. If you wanted a left, you would be paying in the region of 200 to 220 pounds per week. Camden has some very good housing programs right now. One of them is in this beautiful building, which is called the Isocon Building. It's a way for teachers to partially own um, houses in inner city areas. Camden's got an awful lot to offer. It's a, it's a beacon borough. It's very diverse. It's got many different types of schools. We have all sorts. We have a number of refugee children. The children speak 20 different languages. About half the school are actually bilingual. It's one of the toughest places to get into as an AQT simply because the support is excellent, the induction is excellent, the pay is pretty excellent as well. They've got an awful lot of draw for newly qualified teachers because of this fantastic support programme. Well, that may well have aroused your interest in Camden. The next thing you want to know is, are there any jobs for teachers there? Earlier I spoke to Fiona Flynn at the TES to find out and take a look at nationwide job market trends. 
So Fiona, does the diverse borough of Camden have anything to offer teachers this week? Well, I'm afraid that this week it doesn't, Peter, but there are a few interesting jobs that aren't too far away from Camden. Holland Park School are looking for an English team leader, which I think means head of department. There's no salary mentioned. And Queen's Park in Brent are looking for a science teacher. And they welcome NQT, so that's a good job for any new qualifiers to apply for. And the Capital City Academy in Wilsdon are looking for a handful of teachers. They want a part-time teacher, three English teachers and a PE teacher. And because it's an academy, it's uh, government funded, but it's independently run, so they can offer what salaries they like. And they're offering an extra 6% on whatever salary that you're given. Now, we'd never like to trivialise the nature of job hunting for teachers, but there are some schools with fantastic names in the paper this week. Yeah, we really enjoyed finding these uh, in the jobs pages this week, Peter. Two, and they're all looking for head teachers. Um, there are two in Hampshire called Scantabout and Queen's Enclosure. Uh, one in Birmingham called Our Lady and St Rose of Lima, which is quite a mouthful. Hertfordshire have, are looking for a head at Pixies Hill Primary School. Aww. Yeah, and Hums Hall, Church of England First School in rural Northumberland, near, right near Hadrian's Wall. Hums Hall CV School, and they've only got 41 pupils on the roll. Now, in this week's trends, uh, if you're a maths teacher, you're in a, quite a privileged position, aren't you? We've always had a bit of a shortage of maths teachers in this country, but with government incentives uh, to inc recruit more people into teaching maths, that should turn around in a year or two. In the meantime, rich pickings for maths teachers. They can just about go anywhere they like and could probably start to negotiate what kind of salary they like as well. 20% of all secondary schools have advertised for maths teachers so far this year, and that's over a 1,000 maths jobs. Why are people turned off maths? Maybe those who are qualified, who are good at maths, are going into a different kind of a job in academia or in engineering. They're not going into school to teach maths, and that's a real shame. And talking of jobs outside the classroom, there's quite a few interesting ones this week. Well, there's Nate, who are the National Association for the Teaching of English. They're looking for a development and communications director, an experienced English teacher to be the public face of Nate, three days a week, driving around the country and possibly abroad, um, promoting. Nate's policies on you know English as a subject fantastic job for anybody who's passionate about English 33 grand a year pro rata and I see there's a, a rather key managerial job in Bradford advertised this week Serco are the private company who run Bradford Education Department and they want a new managing director but the strange thing is that the salary is only hundred and ten thousand pound a year which oh, is forgive me it sounds reasonable well, it's reasonable for you and me, but uh, there are head teachers earning that amount of money, so it doesn't seem that impressive. And from the land famous for footballers' wives and cheese, but not at the same time, there's quite an interesting job this week. Bramall School up in Cheshire uh, looking for a head of maths, and it's a very posh part of the country. And there's a few interesting jobs further south from Cheshire, isn't there? There's a lot of posts in Hampton School in Peterborough. They're looking to recruit 15 staff. And Buckingham School uh, in Buckingham, one, 11 staff. One of those is for a head of house, which is a nice pastoral job. And then in Pimlico, in, right in central London, they are looking for a director of their special music department. Now, Pimlico's special music department has been on the go since, the, since 1970. They were a specialist school long before specialist schools uh, were known anywhere else. And it's a very prestigious department and a, a pretty prestigious job. Nice one to go for a music specialist. And to see that the uh, riding school are still continuing their search for a head. We were really surprised to see this headship being re-advertised, Peter. It's a really interesting school. It's been turned around from being a, a, a notorious school that's very challenging to being one that's really doing extremely well. Uh, the salary is now negotiable. If I was a head teacher, I'd be applying for that job. I think it's a really good one. Well, we'd love to be able to take you away from all of this feeling, but sadly you're too useful to us in career-wise, so you're here for the moment and we'll see you again soon. And don't forget, you can find out more information about jobs from these websites. Getting a new job might require new skills, and each week on the show we feature a particular course or career development program.
Okay, now it's time for our regular uh, career advice slot with our resident coach, John McKenley. As the debate over the future of Europe continues to rage, it seems less and less likely that many of our young people are going to be able to communicate in another language. Teachers across Britain are discovering that many schools are considering dropping modern languages as a specialist subject due to the apparent lack of interest from pupils. John, who are we going to deal with this week? We'll be hearing from Marianne Struthers, a secondary school German teacher whose subject is disappearing from the curriculum. OK, let's hear her story. I've always loved learning about different languages, learning about how other people live, and I enjoy the challenge of working out the code and, and just understanding people when they're, they're talking another language. I think it's fascinating. Languages are no longer compulsory in the school and that has led to a great number of the Year 9 pupils who are disaffected, demotivated with learning languages. They've chosen to study other subjects at GCSE. We did have, I think, 11 members of staff in the department and now with so many fewer children choosing to do languages, that number of staff are no longer required. We're getting um, a very mixed message from the government as language teachers, as languages have to be compulsory in the primary schools by 2010, and yet in secondary schools pupils are told they don't need to learn a language anymore. When I was working as a PA, I was able to see in the world of work how many different areas languages are needed. I saw people on the shop floor going over to Germany to learn about the latest methods and techniques and bringing that back and getting a promotion because of that. And I try to get that message across to my pupils. It's very demotivating. Although I do teach French, I can speak French, I did A-level French. It's demotivating for me because it's not my main subject. I would rather be teaching German, it's, that's the subject that I'm interested in. If I think about it on a rational level, I can appreciate why they've had to make that decision. A school is a business to run just as anything else. They have wages to pay and German was always the subject with the least amount of pupils choosing it. It was a subject with the lowest results within the three languages. So it was the rational decision to make. On a personal level, I was obviously quite devastated by it. I am a German teacher. I know that in other areas there are more um, language jobs available but my family are based up here. I've got, uh, my mother lives up here. She looks after my two children. I couldn't afford to pay for childcare for two children. That would uh, cost more than I would be getting paid. Um, so I, couldn't, I, I wouldn't be in a position to move somewhere else just for the job. One thing that I'm considering is maybe moving into primary, as primary schools do need people with languages. And I do know about little children. <laughs> Well, Mary Ann's obviously facing some tough choices. John, is this really an example of a crisis in modern languages, or is it just the curriculum being modernised? No, there is a crisis for, in modern language teaching at Key Stage 4 in the secondary school curriculum. It's no longer compulsory, and as a result, uh, pupils are choosing not to take up uh, modern languages. I remember in the, in the 70s, it was your passport out of an economically depressed Britain and Ireland. Uh, why has the importance of modern languages decreased? There's a kind of irony here, and, and uh, Mary Ann picks it up in, the, in her film. The, the government is giving mixed messages. Uh, languages are about to become compulsory in the primary school curriculum, and all primary schools will have to offer a language from 2010. So, um, uh, and yet it's no longer compulsory to do of modern foreign language in the secondary school curriculum. What are you going to do if, if your um, career opportunities are narrowing as schools move away from the languages? The key thing for Marianne is that German is, is the language most in decline. She talked about her French, she can speak French, and she's obviously a linguist, so it's not that she can't pick up other languages, it's whether or not she wants to. And there is, she's right, she also identifies that people um, when they're working or they need it, they need it eco for economic reasons, are prepared to acquire a language. But they're not prepared to acquire a language they don't want to learn in the secondary school. So she has got some options about perhaps getting involved in German teaching uh, in, in a commercial setting 
or in further or adult education. I mean, is this a terminal decline, do you think, or if languages are, are moving into primary schools, then eventually the payoff is that a lot of kids will, maybe five, ten years' time, want to be continuing uh, their language studies uh, up to university level? But that's probably going to be the case, and it's a sad irony for, for Mary Ann that, that she's in that situation. But I have to say one thing, one word of caution. It is unlikely that German will be the first choice, even in the primary school curriculum. We're looking at French and Spanish because people increasingly go there on holiday, they have second homes, and, and those are the languages that are going to be in demand if it's a question of parental demand. What steps should Marianne take now to get her out of this situation, Jan? She needs to um, contact um, the National Organisation for Language Teachers and find out exactly what the guidance is for primary language teachers as well as for the future of the subject in her terms in secondary and to also see whether there are prospects for German teaching in further education and adult education. If she's thinking of retraining as a primary school teacher then she really needs to research her options properly and Teachers Net has got regional career advisors she could talk to because she's also very tied by the area in which she lives in. She doesn't want to move. Well, thanks, John. That advice will, I'm sure, help out Mary Ann. Uh, on the same subject, a lot of teachers qualified in specialised subjects, finding them dropped from secondary school. Is it a good idea that they go into primary? I think we should dispel any idea that secondary school teachers can just jump into primary. Primary teaching is a completely different ball game to secondary teaching. The contexts are different, the training is different, Primary school teachers have to teach the whole national curriculum. Secondary teachers, on the whole, teach one or two of their specialist subjects. Um, it's, it's completely fine if people want to make that jump, but they will need to do some retraining. Thanks again, John. Well, if any of the issues we've been discussing have a relevance for you, you can find out more information. There's details on the screen now. A few weeks ago on CareerWise, we heard from Bryce Wilby, the head teacher of Devon's brand new pupil referral unit. He's been keeping a web diary as the new project develops, and you can read his comments and leave your own online. That's it from CareerWise for this week. Thanks very much indeed to all our guests. Thanks to you, those of you who shared your experiences with us, and thanks very much indeed for watching. Don't forget, if you think there's an issue we should be covering on the show, or you'd like to share your own teaching experience, you can email us careerwise at teachers.tv or you can give us a ring on 0207 428 3190. We'll see you next week.